we should weigh the things that we feel and what we think God has said. We should weigh them. We shouldn't just accept them carte blanche. We should weigh it. What do we weigh it with? Well, how do we measure it? Well, I measure it with love. Is this loving? Is this going to help people experience God and experience his love? So I'm measuring it against that. So I know that if God, if I thought God told me to do something which was contradictory to love, I know it couldn't be him. And people say, well, yeah, but you're you're now saying that God can't do something. Yes, I am. He can't contradict himself as being love. And he wouldn't ask us to contradict himself and contradict what love is either. On your Facebook site, um, someone had posted about how religion has trapped people and that everything they have to do is go back to the Bible and make sure it's in the Bible for them to say it's okay. Yeah. And then actually it was interesting because the first comment after someone posted that was uh, the Bible verse. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And yeah. I think to myself what do they think the word is like it's spoken <laughs> i don't know i'm confused because you know they didn't have bibles back then like i don't get it no i mean it, it is obviously the bible was not in the beginning although very religious fundamental people would believe it was you know they they would believe that it's been there forever but the reality is it's talking about jesus the word who was with God, face to face with God in the beginning. You know, that, that's the reality. Jesus was there in the beginning as the living word of God. And whenever the Bible uses the word of God, it's not referring to something written. It's referring to something spoken. And of course, something can be spoken and then written. But whenever it's like man does not live by bread alone but every word that proceeds from the mouth of god not every word that's written down you know and that's part of the problem we've been so conditioned by evangelical thought on sola scriptura bible alone that the bible has been elevated to even be equal to god which is what that verse they were saying says well the bible is god in the beginning well the reality is the bible's a book bible collection of books biblio collection of books written by lots of different people from lots of different perspectives that represent their view some of them are recording what they believe god said to them prophetic people paul is recording things to help people in the early church from his perspective led by the holy spirit you know, but the, nowhere does the Bible say that it is inspired, inerrant and infallible. And those are the three things that Sola Scriptura and Evangelicals hold to. The Bible would be inerrant, infallible and therefore that. So you get that said, but nowhere does the Bible say that of itself. Because how could it? Because it wasn't a book. It's written by people over thousands of years. So how could the Bible say anything about itself? Because those books were all completed at least 300 years before there was a Bible. So could, how could anyone be quoting anything to say that that is a Bible because the Bible did not exist? Even for anything in the New Testament, it was over 300 years before they put together what they considered to be scriptures, which they took from the scriptures that Constantine accepted as holy scriptures in, in AD 325 in the Council of Nicaea. That was a group of collected things that were written down, which they agreed were inspired. They agreed. Nowhere does it say God said that. Now, you could say, well, God must have been guiding them and all. It's all subjective because there's no evidence for any of that. And there's a lot of evidence that what they did do when they put the Bible together was argue over what should be included. And they left out some things and they included some things. And there was great debate over quite a number of books of whether they should have been included or not. And of course, what they did include was what we now call the Apocrypha 
which were actually a number of books which they said were to be included in the Bible and are still in a number of versions of the Bible, the Ethiopian Bible and the, the Catholic Bible. They're all in there and they accept them as being part of the Bible. But the Protestants threw them out. So they basically took about, I don't know, 15 books out of the Bible that the early church put in the Bible. So if they were inspired by God to put those books in, how could Protestants decide they weren't inspired by God to take them out? I was talking to a guy the other day who's um, fairly evangelical. and We were talking about the Bible and I said, well, which Bible do you mean? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, which version and how many books are in them? And he sort of eventually we got. So I said, well, well, who decided to take out the books that the early church put in? If you're telling me that those people who put the Bible together were inspired by God to include those books. And he didn't have an answer to that because there is no answer to it because those people weren't inspired by God to put together a book. Because God never wanted a book. So whenever that says the word of God, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword. Now, of course, most people. Oh, that's the Bible. No, it's not. It's Jesus. Jesus, as the living word of God, is, is sharp to divide soul and spirit and thoughts and intentions of the heart, not a book. And that is the problem. And then you have, you know, a scripture like you know, three Timothy, two Timothy, three sixteen. You know, that all Scripture is inspired by God. Well, actually, it doesn't say that. And in the English version, it will give capital S because it's saying, "Oh, all the Bible effectively is inspired by God." Well, in reality, it doesn't say that. It says all inspired writing. In fact, it doesn't even say all. It says every inspired writing. Because if you take that from an evangelical perspective and you read that verse, you will take the word to mean that all the Bible is inspired by God and useful for doctrine and correction and everything else. It does not say that. And it's not referring to the Bible. What was it referring to? Every inspired writing. Because every writing that is inspired by God is, of course, going to be useful. But who is to say which writings were inspired by God and which writings were the recordings of people. So I would say the New Testament primarily was the record of Jesus's life recorded from several different perspectives, one by a doctor who was very fastidious about recording accurate details, Luke, two, Matthew and Mark, who were writing particularly to Jewish orth orth readers and because Jesus was challenging the Jewish people to leave the old covenant and walk with him into the new covenant, follow me. And then John's gospel is the gospel which comes out of the intimacy that God had, Jesus had with John and the revelation that John had with the spirit of truth to reveal what Jesus said about the new covenant age to come which records many more statements that are not included in the other Gospels because they are specific statements about the nature and character of God as Jesus being God. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. You, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. You're all of these statements were Jesus saying this is who I am. So that we could have a foundation and a record of who he was. And then the relationship that was developed there in the new commandment that was given by Jesus to love one another as they had been loved by him, which is not a law, but a injunction to find the result of being loved as you will be able to love, which was what the word in tole actually means in the end or the result is that you will love others if you effectively allow me to love you. So. There's such a difference when we come to look at the Bible, what is included, what isn't included. I would say the Old Testament, the majority of it was written for a people who aren't us. 
So it was for a different religion. And therefore, that was their religion that they developed to engage with a God that they didn't know. So it was a system that they developed. I don't believe that system was ever intended by God because it makes it clear in the New Testament that God didn't want sacrifices and offerings. So what? how did they get sacrifices and offerings? Well, why did God go along with it? Because he allowed them and he worked with within the constraints of their religion to try and get them to eventually find and follow him. And he began to prophesy to people exactly that because the prophets revealed that he didn't require sacrifices and offerings. And the prophets revealed the coming of a New Testament, a new covenant that was coming where the word that Jesus, God spoke, would be on their in their hearts, not in tablets of stone or in any written thing, but in their hearts. They would have a new heart, the heart of stone, which is a symbolic thing of the hardness of their hearts, that they were following a religious system, would be replaced by a heart of flesh in that they would be have a new relationship with God based in the truth of that living word so we've got to realize you know even in the psalms which are poetic and songs written to record people's experiences they record experience you can't draw doctrine from a psalm because it was an experience and you've got various things said within one psalm that seem to contradict each other because there are a progression of the person sharing his emotions at the beginning Oh, woe is me, or where are you, God? And, you know, you've let me down. And then, of course, the truth comes out. Well, no, you've never really let me down. I was just feeling like that. You know, so, you know, ultimately, I don't believe we actually need a book because we have the Holy Spirit of truth and Jesus, who is the truth, in relationship to which Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice and follow me. He didn't say my sheep will read the book that is not yet here, but might come 300 years and later or so, and then follow me. Though they had to follow him from the day that he called them to follow him. They had no book to follow because Jesus did not encourage them to follow the old covenant or the old Testament or their Tanakh or their Bible or anything else. He said, come and follow me. Don't follow a system. Don't follow your old ways and what you've been told. Don't follow the Talmud or the written expression of rab rabbinical thought, because that's what he challenged. You've heard it said, but I say unto you something totally different. You've heard it said that you should hate your enemies. No, I tell you to love your enemies. You've heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. No, nope. forgive everybody. So there's a, a redefinition both of who God is because they didn't know God. They didn't have God within them. And most of them only went to God through a priesthood, a mediation system. So none of them met God. And not even the priests met God. Only the high priest once a year would meet the presence of God, the glory of God within the Holy of Holies. So none of them, other than one, had ever met God. So where did they get all these ideas? That they wrote down as their rabbinical thought their own ideas that's where they got it from yeah and jesus came to help them come out of that idea driven rabbinical way of looking at things into following him and he never even hinted that there would be a book that would be our manual for life or what would help no i'm not saying that there isn't some good things within the psalms that express emotions towards god and, and in proverbs and in other i'm not saying that there isn't good things in there and the holy spirit can absolutely bring truth to us through it but why would we want to go through a muddy another mediator of a book when we have the spirit of truth to help us understand the truth and we have jesus in us to help us to follow the truth to guide us into all truth you know where it says in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's not talking about a written word. It's talking about God guiding them, speaking to them and leading them. Now, of course, they did have a lot of stuff that, that were eventually written down. 
But that's not what David was talking about in the Psalms or other psalmists talking about. He's talking about God, the God relationship with God, because David had a relationship with God was outside of his time. You know, he knew that he couldn't escape the presence of the Holy Spirit. He knew because he had an open door into relationship with God because of the nature of who he was and that that relationship God honored in that David served the purpose of God in his generation. And God was a man after God's own heart. David was a man after God's own heart. So, you know, it's a it's a huge issue and people will be so conditioned by it to believe that there is only one way to follow god to be a christian is to read your bible pray every day and hope for the best basically that's really what they're saying read your bible and god will speak to you through it but which version are they going to read are they going to be able to read it with a clear unbiased view or are they already programmed by their upbringing and their teaching that they've received and what are they going to follow? Such So much simpler to follow Jesus. So much simpler to let the Holy Spirit guide and speak, to have a face-to-face -face relationship. Because Jesus, who had a face-to-face -face relationship with God in the beginning, has brought us into a relationship with his Father. So we can have a face-to-face -face relationship with the Father like he had. And that is what Jesus is leading us to. An intimacy of a face-to-face -face relationship with God. We don't need a book. Now, people would say, well, you use the Bible all the time in your teaching. I absolutely do. Because I have to have a grid of reference for most people. You know, and most people would be saying, well, where's that in the Bible? So I'm giving them an opportunity of seeing that what they thought they saw in the Bible probably isn't there in the way they thought it. So I'm helping to re-understand actually what the bible says rather than what we've been conditioned into what the bible says particularly when it comes to the nature of god the nature of the cross and all of that and that grid of reference is a starting point to say look this is what you might believe but actually even in the bible it actually doesn't say what you think it says but i'm helping and encouraging people to go beyond that to go into a relationship of intimacy through meditation and through engaging with God every day in which God will guide and lead to have a dwelling and abiding in the presence of God. So we can never be without the presence of God to be conscious of God's presence within us. Also that inner voice, small, still voice within guiding, directing, keeping us working within our conscience, within those aspects of our soul, within the intuition all of those things are real and are available to us, but we need to be set free from the conditioning that everything must be in the Bible and everything must be orthodox according to whose interpretation? Well, evangelical interpretation. Then you've got reformed interpretation. Then you've got Catholic interpretation. And then you've got orthodox interpretation. And then you've got on and on and on. Baptist interpretation and charismatic and Pentecostal interpretation. They're all using some version of the Bible. Some are heavily that the King jo James Bible is the only Bible authorized by God because it's called the authorized version. And literally, some people seriously believe that. They believe that the King James Version has been authorized by God and no other Bible should be read. And they are serious by that because it has the title authorized. Yeah, well, no, it was authorized by King James, you know, and it was revised several times. Yeah, you know, so it wasn't even the original version that was translated. And actually, so many words in there no longer mean the same thing today in today's language. So to be honest, you know, King James is not the best version to people to read if they want any form of accuracy or understanding. You know, well, what do you read? Well, personally, I don't read any of it anymore. I use it. It's within me. Because I've Im imbibed it, if you like, over the years, reading it over and over again in many different translations. So I carry a knowledge of that word. But my knowledge of that word has been chained by Jesus, the truth, showing me that my interpretation or my understanding of those verses were not correct in many different cases. You know, and I've gone through a number of 
particular things where I've said, look, this has been a cornerstone of evangelical faith. And this verse doesn't say what they say it says. Because it conditions us into a particular way of thinking. You know, things like, you know, the heart is wicked. You know, at that type, it, it doesn't say that. You know, Jesus used the Septuagint version, which is the Greek interpretation of the Bible, which was a more modern translation of their scriptures. And that is what, Paul used and that is what Jesus used when he was quoting things and that version does not use wicked when we have gone back to the Hebrew we've gone back to an older understanding of the Bible which the Septuagint updated I believe to a more truthful way and Jesus used that but he also used that to say your understanding of this has to change so it is a thorny subject for a lot of people obviously who are conditioned into it must be in the bible and you must read the bible and god will speak to you through the bible and they don't have an expectation of any direct communication and even if they did they wouldn't trust it because it's subjective and the bible's objective well no it's not because the bible is a collection of people's subjective experiences and writings they wrote their experiences well, you know, I was told when I first started to get involved in charismatic things, I was told you cannot trust your experience. You can only trust the word of God, the Bible. And well, what if God speaks to me? You can't trust that because you might get it wrong. So if it contradicts the Bible, God couldn't be saying it to you. Well, then God started to say things to me that totally contradicted my interpretation and understanding of the bible so he deconstructed my belief systems my thinking based upon certain bible verses which said things in an evangelical doctrinal way which actually are a misinterpretation of many of the words so you know what would i encourage people i would encourage people if you want to know what the original words meant in the new testament i wouldn't even bother with an old te old testament because why would you want to go back to an old religious thinking when Jesus has already renewed it? But in the New Testament, I would definitely use the Mirror Bible as a, you know, the Passion Translation is also good. But the Mirror Bible with the study notes shows you why certain words mean what they do and they don't mean what we've been told they mean. And that is, I think, an important thing for a lot of people to grasp. Look, what you thought this meant, it doesn't. And he gives you the root meanings of the words and why those words may have been used specifically when other words could be used. Why did they choose those ones? So I, I would encourage that. And it's coming from a mirror perspective that this is going to be a way of reflecting back to you who God says you are. So you see in the relationship with God that this points you to because that's the key you don't have a relationship with god through a book you have a relationship with god through the holy spirit who the book can point you to and jesus who the point the book can point you to but you don't have that relationship with a book it's just a book so you need the holy spirit you need that relationship and therefore the mirror bible helps to develop a relationship that reveals your true nature from finding god's true nature in love and that is the key because it bases everything on the fact that god is love and anything that contradicts the fact that god is love is redefined from its true original meaning which would have never gone from the perspective that god is love no matter what orthodox evangelical theology says and if you really want to know what the early church thought about god jesus and things then go back and read some of the early church fathers writings and they are very very different from evangelical theology being very much more inclusive um, and restoration based and you can find sort of the early church fathers writings and people have put them together in in books which actually indicate you know what did they believe you know, which can help, you know, if you really want to go that far.
uh, for most people, you don't really need that. Just go and hang out with Jesus every day. Go and engage with the Father every day. You'll find that they will give you very great insight into what is true, what is the truth, and help you live your life to God's glory and for the outworking of who you are in relationship with God face to face. And, you know, thus ends the sermon. But it, it is it's something that I'm passionate about because, you know, that that comment, we, I mean, I haven't seen it, but I will I will go and look at it and I might comment on it myself and say, you know, actually, no, the Bible is not the word of God. And it wasn't with God in the beginning. You know? And if you think it was, then go back to God and ask him, you know, well, that what they'll do is go back to the Bible and ask them, ask that, of course, well, speak to me through this. You know, and that's where people get stuck. Anyway. Okay. Anyone else got anything they want to talk about? Mike, I want to just come back to the hardest desperately wicked. You know, one of the things that we we know is, I think we all believe still, is that before we uh, came into union with Christ, we were uh, we needed Christ because of our transgressions before God. So we weren't acceptable to God before we had Christ. Well, so as an evangelical come from the roots, it would tie in my mindset that, you know, while there was something wrong with my heart, because that was my nature that made me and everyone else without Christ unacceptable to God. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's what the theology says. But we were never unacceptable to God. We just thought we were because we chose our own religious path to try and make us acceptable to God by doing things. God never turned away from us. We turned away from him, you know, and even even in the Old Testament and in that period before Jesus came. The lamb was still slain before the foundation of the world. So there was still opportunity to enter into a relationship with God. Yes, it changed through the resurrection and the whole of humanity being born again, born from above and everyone being included in Christ and therefore everyone being made righteous, everyone being forgiven. So no, there is no record and holds nothing against anyone. So there's nothing to separate us from God now other than people's own thinking. But the cross did bring into the a window, if you like, into time, what was already eternal and God's desire that we would all be returned to face to face relationship with him, which is what it says in Ephesians 1, 4. You know, but as you say, the conditioning is that we were all sinners God couldn't look on sin, so we couldn't be have a relationship with God because we were we were basically failures. And therefore, we had to do something to become acceptable to God. Well, what was that? Well, you have to repent and pray and ask God to forgive you and come into your heart. Well, the reality is we'd already been included in his heart. So we don't have to do anything other than come to a realization of what he's already done. But, you know, where it but, says, you know, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, who can understand it? That feeds right into original sin and that we've inherited from Adam this sinful condition that alienated us from God. We didn't. We inherited from Adam lost identity, which meant we didn't know who we were in relationship with God. And if we discovered who we were in relationship with God, we would have recognized we were all children of God in the first place. But well, everyone, including all the other religions and pagan religions and other other religion, were all trying to earn some way of coming back to a deity that they left and turned away from by following the path of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil rather than the path of the tree of life. You know, so ultimately, it doesn't say the heart is deceitful above all things. The Septuagint version says the heart of man is deep beyond all things. And it is the man. Even so, who can know him? Which is a totally different verse, understanding of that verse. It does not say wicked. It's deep. And there's a depth to us because we're made in the image of God. And who can know man other than through God? We can't do it through the flesh. 
And even in the New Testament, it says that. We don't know anyone now according to the flesh. The way we would see them according to our own understanding. We now perceive it all in the spirit. Therefore, there's a completely different dynamic to it all. Mike. Yeah. I, you know, if I'm in union with Christ, at the moment of my past, and I go to spend my life in his pure light, if I don't want to go to that other place where I wait to accept Christ, as I understand it, is that not all also tied? I realize to come into union with God through Christ, but also it's not it's, that has nothing to do with sin. No, because well, it has to do with our, the fact that people choose, for whatever reason, to continue to follow their own understanding and their own path because they don't know the truth of who they really are and are living in that lost identity and if you continue to live in our lost identity it will lead you to a place which god will then continue to use the fire of his love to refine and purify that understanding of your lost identity until you accept your true identity which is being a child of god and having a relationship with god so we end up there because we are seeing things through thing it's nothing to do with behavior because sin is not a verb it's a noun it's a thing that we have and the thing is lost identity because the word hamartia actually means loss of image or loss of form or loss of identity that's what it means it's nothing to do with behavior but he, but he, died, for my, he died for my sins hmm? he died for my sins no, not for my died. identity or i'm mixing up identity with sin obviously yeah he died to take away the sin noun the sin a particular thing not be our behavior he came to take away the sin of the world everyone's lost identity so they could find true identity so he took away the consequence of that lost identity for people because when they came into their real identity they would begun to understand who they were who god was and all of the wonderful things that god has revealed but people who live in lost identity often live in guilt, shame and condemnation because that came in with the following the path of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Suddenly, Adam was ashamed of his nakedness. Suddenly he was ashamed. Where did that come from? Because he chose to follow his own path and he lost connection with God. God said, if you do this, you're going to die. Well, they didn't physically die. So what happened? They died relationally. They lost the intimate relationship they had before. Then their relationship became different. They suddenly felt unworthy. They suddenly felt, I need to hide from God. I need to hide this from God. I need to go into the bushes. They suddenly felt, I'm naked. Because they were naked from the glory that covered them, which was their spiritual identity. They lost that. They lost touch with it. And then, of course, right from the very beginning, they started to come up with their own form to help them feel better about themselves. So God would accept them. Hence, Cain and Abel bring offerings to God. Well, why? Because they wanted to make amends for what they felt. Or, in a certain way, Abel did. Cain had a different perspective to it all having been coming from a different seed line but what he introduced and what they introduced was you need to do something to make yourself acceptable to god so offer this or offer that and they got so extreme that they offered their own children to god in child sacrifice which was why that was not permitted and they brought in, well, if you want sacrifices, you can uh, sacrifice an animal, but you cannot sacrifice your own child before God. Because God hated child sacrifice. He, in fact, he didn't like any sacrifice. Because what it said was, you are trying to come to me through your own efforts. Rather than through relationship. But the only way you could come to God was to go through the fire. The, the way to the tree of life was direct guarded by the fiery sword and the angels with the fiery sword. But you could go through it. They weren't saying you couldn't go, but you had to go through fire. 
which was symbolic of purification. You can't come. You have to renounce your own ways and come in surrender. But of course, they carried on developing greater and greater religious systems that would trap people into, you can do this. You can be acceptable to God by doing this, by giving that, by doing this. And they've all got their own versions of it. And now the version in evangelicals, you can come to God if you repent and renounce your sin and ask Jesus into your heart. And then if you read your Bible, pray every day and witness. Because they add a whole lot of extras to it, of course, to make you feel guilt if you don't do those. Because all religion is based on guilt. It's based on you're not good enough. Therefore, you have to do something to become good enough. Then when you're good, when you've done that, but you know, the word harmatia, some people use the classical Greek meaning of missing the mark as if an archer was firing at a target and missed the mark. And there is a way of interpreting that that way, but it wasn't in Koine Greek. It was classical Greek. But actually, what mark was missed? Not a behavioral standard, because well, I, when I was brought up, I was told you can be 99.99%, but if you don't get 100%, you've missed the mark. You failed, or you can get no percent and you've equally failed. Well, that to me didn't seem very fair. What, you mean I can do an exam and I can get 99.9% .9 right, but I'm still a failure? Well, that wouldn't be acceptable in today's you know, educational system, is it? I mean, how many people do an exam? Right, you need 100% or you fail. And and then it doesn't matter whether you've got 99% or 1%, you still fail and therefore you're equally a failure. And unfortunately, that's how people have interpreted missing the mark. Here's the pass mark, but it wasn't. It was the mark of the bullseye now, the bullseye was your identity. And if you miss the mark, you don't know who you are. So the mark, the standard was your true identity. Missing the mark is doing anything out of your lost identity. You just don't know who you are. So you've missed the truth, if you like. But we've turned it into a standard. There's a path which is perfection, you'll never meet it, so you failed, and therefore you need God. Therefore, it's all about the works that you do to get to that pass mark. Well, Jesus did it for you. Yeah, but you still got to repent, and you still got to do this, and you still got to do that, whereas you don't. Jesus did all that for us. Jesus took our lost identity into death. We all died with him. He resurrected and we were all resurrected with him. And he ascended and we were all ascended with him. So everyone's spirit is operating in the spiritual realm right now, whether they know it or not. Because we're all seated in heavenly places. But people's soul is the issue. They don't know their true identity and who their spirit really is. Everyone's spirit is alive to God. That relationship has been restored. From God's perspective, because he's reconciled everyone to himself, the whole cosmos. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God was in Christ reconciling the whole cosmos to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Why was he not counting their trespasses against them? Because he'd already forgiven them all. They were all gone. They were nailed to the cross figuratively and every accusation of an offense was already removed. So there's nothing to be accused of. But people still accept the accusations because they don't know who they are. So, you know, it, it is a, a difficult one because we've been conditioned into thinking that sin is a verb that is about our behavior. So we keep doing these things which is makes God unhappy with us. And in extreme cases, then God will punish us because we've done these bad things. It is just like, you know, singing a song, which would be like, you know, 
Amazing Grace sings a song. Well, a sin, you know, a wretch, you know, de describing yourself as a sinner rather than a saint, rather than righteous. And if you describe yourself as a sinner because you're conditioned by religion to be, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I'm a son of God. Not a sinner. Because God has revealed my true identity. So I'm no longer lost in the state of what I was before. Therefore, I don't live according to that state anymore. I live in a new perspective from a righteousness perspective, because I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. So my identity is now revealed to see the truth of who we were always intended to be. And we can rediscover that and have that identity restored because God has that Jesus made us righteous. So God was in Christ reconciling the cosmos to himself already a done deal so even god wasn't separated from jesus the father never separated from jesus his whole life including on the cross and including when he went into the grave and including going down into death god was in christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them so yeah we've got to see this is a good news this is very good news you know, we're all included in Christ. We've all died with him. We're all resurrected and we're all alive with him. And we can all enter into the relationship with God through him without having to do anything other than realize that that is available to us and enter into it. You know, rather than jumping through all the religious hoops that religion put on people to be able to, in some way, have a relationship with God. But, but isn't there the person that says, there's just not the person that, that thinks I'm a sinner, but there's also the person that thinks I don't need God. A humanist, okay. right? Okay. That's kind of different again, isn't it? That their lost identity, I guess, because they don't know who they are in Christ, but they also think I don't need God. In fact, we are, in a way, humanists think we are God. We can fix our own problems. Well... In a sense, yeah, the, the whole deception of following that path was that you can be like God without God. Now, the truth was they already were. But now they had to do it by their own self-effort and their own under, through their own understanding rather than through just who they were. So they lost who they were, which was already that. So they were deceived into thinking that they could attain something that they already had. That was a huge deception, which they obviously accepted, you know, and that deception has been what has deceived mankind all the way through. You have to do this yourself now. You can't be acceptable to God, so you have to make yourself acceptable to God. And people are then taking that on to the very thing. Well, no, you are God. There's no external God. You're God. It's all internal. You are God. Well, we're not God. We are sons of God made in God's image and his likeness, but we're not God. So either people were, was, was, oh, well, I'm a worm and I'm no one and I don't deserve anything. And I'm, you know, and have that state or they'll be elevating themselves to the position. Well, I'm God or I'm the Christ consciousness and all of the nonsense, which is going around when people start to go beyond thinking that they're being super spiritual in a sense and actually all they're doing is repackaging the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in another form yeah. which is sad ultimately yeah. so in that case like there's, there's a sin consciousness which is guilt so people that haven't come into union with christ at death that are humanists have a totally different issue that God has to deal with. It's not like, oh, geez, I'm I'm not worthy because I've done all these horrible things. I don't need you. I am. Yeah, exactly. That, that, so that must be. Have you have you countered that in? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And those people who are in anguish of soul because they realize that they're not when they're in the fire of God's love. Oh, they so they realize they're not. 
and they're in anguish because they realize they made a right mess of it. And then they start to believe that there was a hell after all because they were in this place of fire because they're also conditioned. They couldn't believe that God could love them if they rejected him because that's what they've been fed also. They didn't believe it, but suddenly they find themselves in this place where they actually start to believe it. That God has to purify and refine all of those belief systems, mindsets that separate them from him so that they can actually see that they are accepted, they are loved, and this relationship is open to them. Now, many will change their thinking at their point of death when they see the tunnel of light ahead of them and they have an opportunity of Jesus coming and then following him. Many will get it. I got it wrong. I'm following the light now because they will instinctively know that the other way is not the place they want to be. But some are really self-righteously, dogmatically, I'm, I am, there is no God. And whatever this is, I'm not accepting it, God, because they don't want to admit they were wrong. But when they get into that place, God does never stops. Love never fails, never gives up and continues to work on them until they surrender and give up and accept that they were wrong and God isn't holding that against them and has made this wonderful opportunity of relationship immediately there for them. Mike, the, the other thing is the difficulty when you say, you know, if we if we put away the Bible, okay, yeah. and we just try to follow, here, I introduce someone to Christ, just follow him, ask him. The, the problem is, isn't the problem our mindsets that I think, of? because I've seen people under the presence of God speak things which are not garbage. Yeah. And think it's God because I'm inspired. I, I lived in that for years. Yeah. And it's like absolute nonsense they, they say. But they were they were under the they would call it the anointing the presence of God. Yeah. I mean with Rodney Howard Brown when he said the most stupid things. Yep. Because we're still And he was touching people and they were being touched by God. Yeah. Because the gifts and calls of God in that sense are, are without revoke. God is willing, usually willing vessels, even if we're not perfect. But my yeah. point there is that if I, I come into the, the light and say, okay, just follow Jesus, and, you know, just ask him and all that, which is what in a way when he, when he was walking around that, that's what I, I think he was trying to do. Yeah. And the fact is, because of his mindset. For example, if you don't speak to three people a day, I can't, the spirit of God doesn't dwell in you, he said when I was there. Yeah, and name. stuff like that, and and so that's because there's that maybe the evangelical call in his life or something, but not on, on maybe my life. Hmm. But the fact is that just trying to follow hmm. Christ in the light because of our mindset, our mindset. I mean, that's what happens with the prophets we have today, especially the political prophets. <laughs> yeah. and, and in fact, they really believe it because of the presence of God. There, there is an anointing. They are, you know, they know God, Christ. And that's that's a danger, I think, sometimes of like that I that the presence of God comes on me and I think something and then I find oh it's God and I find out I don't know about yeah. you guys and then I find out no oh, that wasn't God <laughs> but I yeah. thought it was yeah well yes and I think that's why we should weigh the things that we feel and what we think God has said we should weigh them we shouldn't just accept them carte blanche we should weigh it what do we weigh it with well how do we measure it well i measure it with love is this loving is this going to help people experience god and experience his love so i'm measuring it against that so i know that if god if i thought god told me to do something which was contradictory to love i know it couldn't be him and people say well yeah but you're you're now saying that god can't do something yes i am he can't contradict himself as being love. And he wouldn't ask us to contradict himself and contradict what love is either. So whenever something we think God said is not aligned to true love and true unconditional love, then we've got to question it. And we're all in a process of having our minds renewed so that we won't be molded and shaped by the upbringing and the conditioning and the programming that we've received. Our mind gets renewed, so we're not pressed into that shape. 
involved. We're actually being transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can be metamorphosed into who he said we were in the beginning. And that whole process is a relational process that he, by experience that we have of him, will change our minds. We can't change it by trying to use the bible to change our minds because we've we got into the problem because of the bible in the first place most of the time so what are we going to use to change our minds well we're not going to change our minds he's going to change our mind when we allow him to do so by submitting ourselves to the experience of the relationship he gives us and weighing all of that with love as our measuring stick and the balance that we use is this love? Yes. I'm going to totally accept that. Is it not love? Oh, I must have got that wrong. I'm going to take it back to the father and ask him why I got the interpretation of that wrong. How did I misunderstand that? Because my mindset helped me under misunderstand it. So I'm going to ask him. And I did many times when I had an experience that didn't line up with what I thought cognitive dissonance took place and i have a choice i am double-minded what is true my experience or what my belief system said was true now very quickly i got to understand that my experience most of the time was what i needed to trust if it was aligned to love if my experience wasn't aligned to love my interpretation of the experience was probably what was the problem with it and I had many interpretations of my experiences, which were not true because they were programmed by what I thought. So between 2005 and 2010, I had a number of experiences which I described as hell-like experiences. And I used that word because I had no other reference point at that point in my life. And so I thought I had encountered hell. And therefore, my framework for that understanding was the sort of usual understanding of hell. And that's what I would have said that experience meant. Because I couldn't see anything else. I had no other grid of reference for anything else. Now, once I've actually encountered God and encountered love, I then can revisit those experiences and actually see what God was really trying to show me through those experiences. And see that I completely misunderstood and misinterpreted the experiences, as do all those people who say they've been in hell for 10 minutes or whatever. You know, they're framing their experience through their theological understanding of hell. Rather than the truth. So they see what they're expecting to see. That's the problem. We can be confirmationally biased to create our own scenario around what God is trying to show us. Which is why we've got to let God renew our minds and trust him in the process of renewing our minds and don't fight against him, but don't be also naive as to think everything that I'm thinking is correct because I'm still in a process, but I'd rather err on the side of love in everything that I'm thinking than err on the side of something else. Because I'm not going to go that far wrong if I'm interpreting everything through love. I might get minor things in it sort of a bit messed up or twist. But bottom line is love is not going to go too far wrong if I err on that side. If I go on the other side of judgment and condemnation and all the other things that could be interpreted in some of the things, then I'm beyond the scope of love and I don't go there anymore, you know, but it took a long time for my mind to be deprogrammed from my religious upbringing and from the programming of evangelicalism and other, the other nine pillars of my mind. Because when I went through this process, the father showed me what my mind looked like figuratively as being held up by nine pillars that supported my belief system. There was this grid over my mind held up by nine pillars. And I'm very surprised 
obviously, when he showed me that. And he said, do you want me to remove these pillars from your mind? And he showed me what each of them were, nine pillars. I think six of them were religious pillars because I was brought up in a very religious way in some ways. And three were cultural or scientific because I also had an education which I embrace, you know, some form of cultural relativism and that type of thing. So then it's like, oh, so this is what is framing how I view the world and how I understand and perceive reality around me. The first one was evangelicalism. That was the strongest pillar in my mind. So he took it out first. And he shook me to the core by taking out that pillar of evangelicalism and every evangelical thought I ever had was challenged. Particularly penal substitutionary atonement, which was the first thing that got challenged, which started to shape that pillar. Because it didn't, God just didn't take the pillar out. He shook it and shook my beliefs that cre created instability in my belief system around those things. And penal substitutionary atonement was the first one. And when I started to challenge that in talking to people, because I was challenged and I said, look, I no longer believe this is the truth. One lady who was in the mystic sort of thing in some of the mentoring groups. She emailed me saying, you have, you are trying to take away the cornerstone of my faith. And she was serious. She was so angry with me. Because she wanted to maintain penal substitution and atonement because it was the cornerstone of her faith. And I'm like, Okay, if that's where you want to stay, fine, you know, but I'm not staying there. So I moved on. And of course, that upset a lot of people or some people. But a lot of people just resonated with the fact that, oh, yeah. That doesn't make any sense that God as father would kill his son and punish him. You know, it don't make any sense at all. And then you go look into it and see it's only a 10th century doctrine. They didn't believe it in the early church. There was no penal substitution atonement. The atonement or what Jesus did on the cross was Christus victor, mostly. Christ victorious over what? Our lost identity, our death, over everything. A very different view of what Jesus did. But the evangelical sort of group and effectively Protestantism very quickly picked up on penal substitution atonement. And it became the cornerstone of Calvinism and, and lots of other streams of thought. And actually, when that got removed, and when that evangelical pillar crumbled, all the other pillars started to wobble. So Sola Scriptura was the second pillar. Well, without evangelicalism holding it up, that went over, which is why it changed my whole view about the Bible and the way I see the Bible and the Bible be in the word of God and all that stuff was got to be in the Bible. And, you know, and all of the challenge that came with that, because God totally took me to task over it. And I was like, oh, this is hard, you know, <laughs> but good, you know. And then one by one, all those pillars began to collapse and fall. You know, and eventually, you know, and there were like, Augustinianism was another pillar. I mean, I didn't, I'd never studied Augustine. I, I, you know, I knew a little bit about Augustine, and but I never studied him. I didn't know what Augustinianism was. So I had to go and look it up. When God said, well, one of the pillars is Augustinianism, I thought, how did I get that as a mindset? Because it was embraced within brethrenism and other streams of thought. Hebrew mindsets greek mindsets both included within the pillar system of my mind again i thought how did i get those because they're based within the system of teaching that i'd received all the way through so eventually when all those pillars collapse it's like okay well what is there now that's the mind of christ yeah there is a new reality that love now frames my thinking. 
that God frames my thinking from a totally different perspective, that religion has been removed. Now, I'm not saying that there's not still things to do and God still did things along the way, but he could do things because my mind was now open to him. So when the whole hell issue and all that, my mind was open to him when he started to challenge my understanding of old covenant and my old covenant thinking of trying to be obedient to God and trying to please God and trying to earn really again by being obedient. And it was like, I'm not under the law. Oh, oh yeah. Why am I trying to be obedient to a law when I'm not under a law? Because I was framed that way by evangelicalism. So I had to realize that there are layers and layers of thinking that still needed renewing, even when the system of belief was removed, there's still neural pathways that took me to beliefs that needed to be renewed and undone. And deconstruction has continued to go on all the way through that period so that I could be free from the religious perspectives that had kept me in bondage and kept me from knowing the true nature of God and the true nature of myself as a son of God and the true nature of creation and all of the wonderful things that we have embraced of being part of that, you know, so. But it's not an easy thing, you know, I gotta be honest, you know, it is indoctrination. People who've been in a cult and they come out of that cult it's very difficult to get the cult out of them. They have to go through a process of deprogramming, which is not easy because the programs are based on reward and fear, which is exactly what the evangelical programming is based on. Fear of hell, fear of losing your salvation, fear of being punished, fear, fear, fear. But perfect love casts out fear. So where's God within that? Yeah, and that is part of the problem. Yeah, you know, we don't know to what degree we're being programmed until God starts to deprogram us. And I would say that evangelicalism is very cult-like in the way in which it uses guilt and shame and condemnation to control people and keep people in line and keep people to tow the denominational line or the church line of whatever those beliefs are. Because you can't belong unless you believe like us, which is the fear. Oh, I'm going to be on my own. And how many have been told, well, if you leave the church or you're coming out under the covering, Satan will get you. You know, and all of those fear based things that we've all been told, you know. Well, God is love and God loves us unconditionally. And he wants us to enter into the fullness of that and that will change our thinking and and we will find that we get deconstructed from all of those belief systems if we cooperate with him and we don't keep resisting and fighting to hold on to our previous beliefs which yeah i discovered most of them were warped at least if not completely wrong once you are susceptible to programming because the nature of the organizations in you trust being fed by your pastor and being fed by the apostle or being fed by the prophet and that they hear from God and tell you that God said this, then you are susceptible to receiving beliefs which are clearly not true. But because you trust the system you're in, you believe them. Hence all sorts of conspiracies, hence all these prophetic people come out with all this political stuff. It gets bought hook line and sinker by people because they're conditioned that those people must be right because they're prophets they must hear god you know and the reality is we need to hear god for ourselves and don't buy anything anyone else says including me and anybody else unless god affirms it to you or i affirm what god has already said to you just don't accept anything from anybody as gospel truth without actually getting that truth from Jesus, the truth. And Jesus said to me, I'm the best fact checker there is. So I take anything that is dubious or I'm concerned about or thinking that can't be true. Or is that true? 
I take it before him. I said, okay, I'm presenting that to you. And the more I hang out with the truth, the more I pick up things that aren't true because they carry the wrong frequency. They vibrate at a discordant frequency that is not harmonious with the truth. And, I, and it becomes easier to discern what isn't and isn't true because we practice by training our senses to discern by hanging out with the truth who helps us discern what is true and what isn't true. And I think that's where we can be safe in that relationship. And then love is always the backdrop. It's always the backstop. Love is always going to be the thing that you ultimately use in that discernment process. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.